Good morning and welcome to my YouTube channel. This is Dr. Carmen McGinnis. On this channel we discuss things that pertain to relationships of all sorts including what I call the primary relationship which is the relationship that we have with ourselves. I am a board certified behavior analyst and health psychologist and I am here to address such topics. So this morning we are going to discuss models of intimacy. And uh, by intimacy, I refer to what makes you feel close, feel connected to your partner, your parents, siblings, your children, friends. And if you're fortunate enough to have that sort of job situation, your coworkers. All of that said, my focus today is going to be on romantic relationships, partners, because, well, because that's what most of us think of when we think of intimacy and I think that's why most of us are here on my channel. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about today but be advised that your particular model of intimacy will be uh, present throughout your relationships not just in the bedroom and this is one of the reasons why it's so very important to go into this topic. Intimacy has been defined as a lowering of boundaries. We might call that the willingness to be vulnerable, and some have. That's one of the definitions of intimacy. If you think of two circles, for instance, two circles, two rings, we might say, such as in a union, as being two separate people who overlap, like a, a Venn diagram, it draws a good visual of what intimacy is. The model of intimacy you have will determine who you attract into your life and what your particular intimate relationship will be like. According to relationship studies, it isn't healthy to fully overlap or to lose yourself in your relationship, but it is also not healthy or we might say not intimacy at all, to hold back too much of yourself, to be separate in your relationship. And there are, of course, two circles here. Are you joining, uh, or is one circle being obscured by the other? Are you being obscured by someone else, or are you the one obscuring someone else? So these are the sorts of things that we need to look at. It's an affliction of makers of fantasy to allow their boundaries to drop whilst others keep theirs up. That particular practice should be limited to fiction writing and perhaps talks with one's therapist. You lower your boundaries, your therapist doesn't. My point is, it isn't intimacy to drop the shields and hope for the best. It might feel good in the moment but in fact it's a fantasy and I'm going to put up a link here for the fantasy bond video that I did a while ago. To feel close, really close, connected, we must let down our boundaries but also experience the other doing the same. If not, if we sense that we're being fooled or that we're perhaps fooling ourselves or both, then in this case we might feel shame. We might ask, are we not lovable? Or are we not able to love? And this may well fall back on either childhood with a parent who we trusted fully but who was somewhat guarded, not always emotionally available to us, or it may fall back to an early romantic partner who perhaps betrayed us. And this takes us to the topic of closeness. There is of course physical closeness and there is also psychological closeness. Intimacy with a romantic partner involves both. But before we move on through these, through the different models that I'm going to um, present here today, Understand that any of them might have roots in your early childhood or your first loves. 
We learn to nurture and be nurtured. We learn to self-soothe, to regulate our emotions. We learn who we are, that we matter or not, from seeing ourselves in our parents' eyes. And we learn how much of ourselves we have to give in order to get back what we need. And if we have not learned these things in childhood, if we leave adolescence without a clear vision of these, our lessons continue, and probably with romantic partners that are themselves injured. And we learn from those first loves. So we can see where things can get tricky and can go kind of downhill. So, what is your particular model of intimacy? I ask because it really, really, really matters. It matters to every relationship you have throughout your life, including the relationship that you have with yourself, what I call the primary relationship, as I said earlier. Think about it. To be intimate with oneself is to let down one's boundaries for self-discovery, to allow in those parts of you that are perhaps hidden from yourself that you might discover, and to change, to allow yourself to evolve, to let in new aspects of yourself. So if knowing how you are intimate is important to every relationship you have, you might want to figure it out. And you, my friend, are best suited to do that. For the rest of our time together, I'll propose and describe some models of intimacy that I've encountered and experienced because I'm human, but that I have encountered in friendships, in relationships with um, employers, employees, in therapy with uh, my clients. And you're not going to resolve this today. You're not going to necessarily resolve this question today. You might. There might be an aha moment. But I'll give you some things to consider, if nothing else, so that taking this forward, you can think about it more deeply. When exploring your particular model of intimacy, a first question is, are you more or less when you're intimate? Do you sacrifice yourself make yourself less so that your partner can be more? Do you feel closer and more connected when you can persuade your partner uh, regarding life and how to proceed so that you're more? Or must you surrender to the chase in order to let down your boundaries? Or must you be rescued in order to feel safe and secure with a partner. Models of intimacy are not that different to sexual fantasies. Are you someone who doesn't make love until you've decided to trust? Or do you make love in order to decide if you can trust? No judgment intended. Sometimes the boundaries must come down before you can know whether to continue to trust or not. Just understand that you must be a strong person to make that determination because it might sting to find out whether or not you can trust. Are you up to the sting or will it set you back for years to come? Will it set you back so that finding someone with whom you can be intimate again is painful? And difficult. And maybe you've been changed by the sting. Maybe you no longer trust enough to even go forward with intimacy. And what does that mean to your love life? Does that mean that you don't get involved at all? Or does it mean that you become a casual lover? Is your model one of loyalty? Loyalty alone is a component of intimacy, but not a standalone model unless you're a secret keeper. Secret keepers tend to have emerged from childhood. They are codependents. They feel responsible for the family narrative. 
do you sacrifice yourself before you can feel connected? Allow yourself to do all the work in the relationship, even if you're exhausted and spent, even when it doesn't feel good. Or are you a nurturer, a mother to the other? This is different to sacrifice. In this model, it feels good to nurture. However, are you getting nurtured too? Do you treat your beloved as an extension of yourself, failing to recognize his or her unique part in the relationship? Or does your partner do this to you? If so, is the intimacy one-sided? And that's a misnomer in and of itself. The person who does this may lack empathy. They may lack the ability to understand the position, feelings, and thoughts of another. And this will show up in all of your relationships. If you're doing this, or if you're accepting that intimate partner into your life. Children raised by someone like this fail to learn who they are other than being a reflection of their own parents. Just as recognizing yourself and other in intimacy is important, so too is an appropriate amount of detachment. And I'm not speaking here of avoidance, but rather of the ability to hold close while understanding that you are two different people, two circles not fully overlapped. For example, I want, and these are quotes, for example, I want to be happy whether I'm in your life or not, to your lover, or to your child. I want you to go to the college of your choice, not the one that's here in town and close to mommy. Or to your aging parent or aging friend, I respect your decision to decline chemotherapy. Often people who lack detachment require an argument, a time in which they are fully alone and separate, angry, detached, completely detached, before they can come together again and be intimate. We can see the problems here. And this is a model uh, that will flow over to your children as well, if you have children. Building a behavioral chain in which, again a quote, I have to get in trouble. I have to tantrum before I get love and attention. And then the cycle starts anew. So there are some things for you, some questions to think about when you consider what your particular model of intimacy is. Bottom line, intimacy is hard work. It requires clear boundaries of your own before you can lower them to let in someone else. And when you do, be sure that they, too, are lowering their boundaries that they're open, available, and vulnerable to you. So I sincerely hope this has been helpful, and um, I look forward to seeing you for my midweek sneak peek as to what we'll be discussing this coming week. I have a few ideas in mind. I will see you on Wednesday for that, and I will see you next Sunday right here on my channel for next week's segment. Until then, have a wonderful week.